to the last part because I forgot my notes. So this sermon is shorter than normal. It's okay, right? Are you guys okay with that? Okay, perfect. <laughs> 500 years before Jesus was born and wrapped in cloth and placed in a manger. 500 years before the Magi came and gave gifts to Jesus. 500 years before the 12 disciples were on earth. People would come to the temple. There were people who were born Jews, and there were people who were Gentiles, who were excited to be able to, to learn more about Yahweh, El Shaddai, to learn more about him and to love him. And so they would have this moment where they would come on out. They didn't want to bring Tweety Bird 300 miles to go and sacrifice him. So what they did was many of the people who were traveling all over Israel would come on up to the Mount of Olives, this beautiful mountain, beautiful hill. And it overlooks so much of, of Israel. And there's, there's olive trees everywhere. A breeze brushes right through the area. And they would come on up, Jews and Gentiles, the outsiders, the ones who weren't born into this. And they would come on up and they would come to a table. And, and they would start to uh, be able to exchange their money. See, a lot of the coins that they ended up collecting also had the face of other gods on them. And so they would come on in and they would... They would exchange those types of coins for coins that were appropriate to give and to bring into the temple. And so when they came on in, they, they also wanted to buy maybe some animals. They didn't want to travel so far with the sacrificial animals. Some of them didn't have the means to do so or the money in which to do so. So they go up and they would go ahead and they would buy whatever sacrifice that they could afford, whether it was a dove, or a cow or something else. And they would come to the temple. Everyone was invited to the temple to be able to give to God, to sacrifice to God. And the, the, the price was not too great because everyone could get something and to give something to God and to get something from God, no matter where they were. 500 years later, that all changed. You see, instead of everyone being invited to the Mount of Olives, they ended up creating this, this space where, where they brought on into this engorged, this gigantic, this built on Temple Mount that King Herod the Great or King Herod the Horrible, however you want to say it, ended up building. And so he created two sections, a section for the Gentiles and a section for just the Jews. And the Jews could go off and they could find animals and they could do their, their sacrifices away from their temple, but the Gentiles couldn't. So the only place that they could go was inside of this temple. And they would come on in into the temple, bringing their coins that had the, the shapes of gods on them. And they would go ahead and they would start to exchange these coins, getting ripped off. And then they would come on in and, and as they, they continued, they... They, they actually had the animals near the temple, and so you'd, you'd smell and hear the animals, and you would smell doo-doo all over the place, and it was just not dedicated to God. See, many times there was a special kind of incense that wafted through the air, and it was pleasing to the nose. But on the Gentile side, it was complete chaos. So all you would hear was coins going on in, especially in a place of worship. And they would continue to bring these coins. And they would continue to make this noise. And, and if you went there, and she, it's, it's actually stated that Jesus went on in. And he looked, and then he left, and then he came back in. And he was absolutely angered because of the type of style that they had created for those people who were called outsiders and not allowed to go to all places of the temple. And so they would hear all the coins, they would hear all the cows, they would hear the birds, they would smell everything, and somehow these Gentiles were supposed to be given the place to worship God. Somehow they were supposed to meditate. Somehow they were supposed to connect and to be able to feel like they were getting closer to Yahweh. And Jesus was furious. Jesus comes on in and he starts whipping the air. He starts hitting people. He starts grabbing the tables and throwing them. The coins started jumping all over the place. Before this is an important facet. See, Jesus had went on a colt and ridden down the road. 
It was a royal procession. It was people being able to put kingship on Jesus. And so when he went to this temple, he had authority. Authority that even the church people, even the pastors, even the top over the pastors were not able to stop. Jesus had that amount of authority within that temple. It'd be like someone going off into the GC and started the general conference and starting to whip people. Go up to Ted, uh, Ted Wilson. I won't continue along that conversation. But the craziest things would end up happening if Jesus walked into a place. And what was the reason that Jesus was so angry? One of those reasons that he was so angry is stated in Matthew chapter 21. If you guys have your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. And I'll read it as you guys are going to that verse. It says, And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a robber's day. There is insane meaning in just that last part of the statement. Because when he says it's supposed to be a house of prayer, some of us might, might go ahead and just picture people coming on in and just praying. But in his context, people would immediately, they would, they, would, they would resonate with certain parts of scripture. See, if you went back and you looked at Isaiah chapter 56, that entire chapter is dedicated towards one thing. And that's becoming a church without walls. It was a place where both Gentiles and Jews could come on in and worship God. It would be a house of prayer for not just those who felt they belonged, but those who felt like they were on the outside. But they wanted to get to know Yahweh. They wanted to get to know El Shaddai. They wanted to get to know God. And so they would come on in and they would be able to worship God in such a beautiful way. Because God's not shutting the doors on them. He's lowering the walls of obstruction and allowing people to be in a phase of belonging before they completely, absolutely believe every single thing. To belong before they absolutely, completely behave. That God says you belong in my family and you belong in this area no matter where you're from, no matter no matter. Where, what people's group that you fit into, you belong here. In the second part of the saying, it says, but you are making it a robber's den. This is in reference to the very next book after Isaiah, in Jeremiah chapter 7. In Jeremiah chapter 7, God is absolutely ticked. He's absolutely ticked because Instead of it being a church without walls, it became walls without church. So when you look at a walls without church instance, it becomes a house with a bunch of liars. It becomes a house with a bunch of idolaters. It becomes a house with people who are trying to steal from the very people who are trying to give to God. Who are trying to come on in and give their hearts to God. That's the kind of experience that ticked Jesus off when he walked into that temple. Instead of being such a beautiful place of invitation, it became a place of obstruction, leading people away from the church and leading people away from God. You can see the difference of Jesus' attitude that a church without walls or walls without church. We can oftentimes bring that into nowadays. We can bring that into today's light. We have many of the same things that can happen throughout the world, church. We can be able to see people making things so legalistic that people are trying to earn their way to salvation. They're trying to work their way into salvation when Jesus gives that for free. You get people at the, on, the, on their deathbeds wondering if they're good enough, wondering if, am I good enough? Am I good enough? Have I paid enough? Have I acted just the right way? Am I really going to be saved? 
as they have experienced walls without church instead of church without walls. This experience can continue to harm people, but we are called today to be a church without walls. Church without walls is not merely a ministry, but it is a motto in which we have adopted here in this church. Are we perfect with it? No, but what we want to do is we want to encourage this church to continue to lower those walls and continue to embrace people who don't exactly look like us, who don't exactly talk, talk like us, who don't exactly come across as the most, most warm and cuddly people. Church Without Walls looks something like on, on Steve's experience or people experiencing um, the uh, off-road ministries when people smell of smoke because they just finished a cigarette or when they smell of beer and yet um, Steve and others who have been a part of the off-road ministries come and they just embrace them and they say, you belong here. It also looks like Love Paradise with the DRND, where people haven't earned that couch, they haven't earned that table, and they get to walk on in and be embraced and be loved, and there's, there's no requirement other than we love you, and we're giving the same grace that Jesus is giving you, and they go home and they're just like, man, this is beautiful, this is wonderful. Church Without Walls looks like a go-giver. The, the, the theme that we ended up having uh, over a year ago, where it said just Go and give. Stop thinking of the world as something you have to go out and get. It goes out and it gives without boundaries. It continues to love people who have not deserved it. it continues to embrace people just like us. Who in many people's eyes would not be qualified for salvation. But thank God that he believes in a church without walls, because we're alive. We have to continue to allow others in at the same rate as Jesus continues to let us in. And when we go on over to that church that we have built, that expanded church, bigger than what we've experienced here, we don't change into something different. Walking in the opposite direction in which Jesus has been leading us towards more church without walls experiences. The church without walls experience of opening up the gym, especially like we have tonight, being able just to bring anyone. Experiences where they don't have to go ahead and, 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 and come to a gym and have to listen to an hour and a half sermon, but they're just loved and they get to be able to experience hanging out with each other. Church without walls has so many facets of that. But it's a motto that we must live. Because it's Jesus' original purpose for his family. It doesn't matter if people are, are Buddhist or Hindu. It doesn't matter. They're still God's family and they still deserve to be loved no matter what. It doesn't matter if you're Republican. It doesn't matter if you're Democrat. It doesn't matter if you're black. It doesn't matter if you're white. You belong to the family of God. I think if I have a message and then I could give one last message, it would be this. As we experience God's grace in looking at a church without walls, a church without the boundaries of having to leave all the little teeny tiny facets before we are allowed in, we can believe in one that embraces those who don't feel like they're allowed in. Yeah. We can become that church even more each day. The amount of things that we're going to do over there is going to expand even further into this community and beyond than we could ever dream of. Let's continue yeah. to be a church without walls and never walls without church. Let's pray. Yeah. Dear God, Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for encouraging us. Encouraging us with love, God. You have loved us more than we could ever deserve, more than we could ever imagine. God, love is only awakened by love. We ask that we can be able to open up our hearts and allow your love in. Lord, be with us.
us today. Continue to show us just how much we're loved so that we can be able to love others in a very similar way. And that we can look in the mirror and love ourselves in a very similar way. Not thinking that salvation is something we deserve, but it's a gift from you. And the experience of you is for every single person on this planet. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. songs when I was a teenager. Maybe for some of you the same. Let's sing. They'll know we are Christians by our love. So thank you. Thank you for highlighting that uh, initial visit in the middle of COVID where we were crafting uh, youth hikes out to Monkey's Face and all that stuff. Would you say thank you to Bridget for uh, the faith in allowing Larry to come out site visit and then deciding to move here? I just thought, what kind of phone conversations were those? Yeah, Bridget, uh, yep, the town's burned down. Just like they said, we should move here. <laughs> So where is Bridget here somewhere? Is, right there. Yeah, thank you. And you're welcome for not inviting you forward with Larry and doing a big attention on you. <laughs> How to do it. Yeah. Um, what I'm trying to say is thank you guys for being in our community and modeling a life of Church Without Walls and opening your home. And uh, I waved to Larry this week. Uh, he and his dog Duke were heading up Skyway. Duke rides with his head out the, the sunroof, and um, they drive up into one of the most redneck towns in our region, Sterling City, and hike regularly, models a life without walls and without categories. It's beautiful. 
I waved to him, and I thought, I'm pretty recognizable in my Jeep. Later he said, oh, I just realized it was you as you're passing, everyone waves to me with Duke out the back or out the top. <laughs> so thanks for being an ambassador of a life without walls. Um, another thing I want to highlight today on Father's Day, thank you men for who you are in our community. On a personal level, I want to thank you for being a place that, that we are raising our children. And I have not been part of a community where there has been as many men that I craved for my kids to grow up around and be a picture of a man of God. This community is so highly blessed in that. Let me nerd out just a little bit on church growth statistics for you. We know that if the mom attends church regularly, but the dad does not, statistics show us that one in 50 children will attend regularly in their adult life. If you switch that number, that the father of the home attends church regularly, but the mother does not, over two thirds of those children will regularly attend church in their adult life. I mean, this is just almost an obscene number that is, is known in church development. So I would like to bring recognition to you men in this community because I believe the active example of men in this church community is a huge part of why the Paradise Church is multi-generation and we have an education system that is thriving with young people in it today. Would you give the men of this community a hand? <laughs> really, I think mean, that, that is a statistical evidence of why we have multi-generation in Paradise is because the active involvement and example of faithful men of God in this community. And I thank you on behalf of the Hamilton children for growing up in that. Thank you. So we decided that because it's multi-generational evidence of the men in this community, uh, our multi-generation Church Without Walls Fund is where the money for pie came from today. If you look over in this direction, there is pie and ice cream and Larry left extra time, which I took up in my small speech. But don't rush off. Please eat pie together as you leave and please uh, say thank you to the men of this community as you eat that pie because the multi-generation evidence of their example and leadership here, uh, we are enjoying and appreciating that. So Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Please let Pastor Larry's words on your behalf sink deep into our hearts. May we never be walls without church. Let us be a church that exemplifies your image and your love and grace in this community. And thank you for men on this Father's Day weekend for the example and the leadership and the influence they bring in our community. So bless the pie and may it not only nourish our bodies, but certainly nourish our spirits, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.